There's been a fair bit of information uh, around the place on volcanic ash, and uh, I thought that it, it would be interesting to just look at a bit of the background uh, of volcanic ash. There's been some magnificent photos uh, floating around on the internet. Um, that's one of the wind dispersing it close to the ground. You've got to feel sorry for the people who live in the vicinity of this because they end up with ash covering everything. And that looks like a, a snowstorm, doesn't it? But it's ash. And <clears throat> as well as flying through it, it can affect an aeroplane. And just imagine cleaning that aeroplane before it flies. When it comes to volcanic ash, there is an advisory centre uh, called a VAC. <coughs> and it's a group of responsible people who coordinate um, the information that's available and make it available to the aviation industry. The organisation is coordinated through the Civil Aviation Organisation, ICAO, and it's under the umbrella of United Nations, so it's no small deal. And uh, individuals, uh, individual VACs, um, form part of the National Weather Forecasting Organisation, so our bureaus of meteorology have a good handle on this. There are nine VACs around the world, and that's where they are. <clears throat> in the centre of the bottom, there's one in Darwin, but there's Anchorage, Washington. Da, 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 da. So there's a map of the world, and there's the uh, breakup of where these backs are, and that's the one which Australia administers, administers from Darwin. So the volcanic, volcanic ash particles are called tephra, and they're nasty little pieces of gear. Um, <clears throat> it's dangerous to aviation uh, in the region where jets operate. That's what one piece of ash looks like. And so at that size, if you blade them out, you'd get a dozen of them on a pinhead. And uh, they've got all that airspace in them as well, and that's what makes them fly around the place. One of the unfortunate things about them is that they melt <coughs> at, at 1,100 degrees Celsius. But the average jet engine operates at around about plus or minus a couple of hundred degrees. 1500, so any that's ingested into an aircraft is uh, melted and ends up in certain parts of the aeroplane or engine where it shouldn't be. As well as sandblasting the outside of the aircraft is causing havoc inside the aircraft, inside the engine, the air conditioning, air bleed systems and so on. So there we have a diagram of a jet engine with the cool air coming into it being uh, compressed and going through the, the burners and then out the back. These are the two critical points in the engine, the burners <coughs> where the temperature goes up and the turbine blades at the back end of the engine. They're the ones that do all the work in the very hot environment and they're the ones that, that suffer with this molten uh, ash. So <coughs> you can imagine that if an aircraft flies through some of this stuff the engine rebuild can be very, very expensive because it abrades as well as sticks to all of these parts and a lot of those components have got to be replaced. So ash clouds <coughs> can't be detected by weather radar, so as you fly along comfortably at 30,000 feet in a jet, um, the pilot who's looking at his weather radar hasn't got any idea that there could be ash ahead. It gets a little bit worse because in daylight it looks like a normal uh, meteorological cloud formed by water vapour. And at night it even becomes worse. They can't see it and there's a possibility of flying into it. So these VACs <coughs> take satellite data. And uh, I'll just indulge myself a little bit here. Um, that's a drawing of a, a satellite piece of gear, uh, not one that's used in this particular sphere, but it takes information <coughs> in a number of bands of the spectrum and records it on board as digital data. 
You can imagine them as photos, but it's really a digital file. So <coughs> these satellites sense in the, the wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And if we look at that diagram down there, the first three of these are the equivalent of photos or digital data sets which would be in what we call the visible spectrum, red, green and blue. But as we work this way, we work through the infrared range, uh, invisible to the human eye, and then into the heat sensing area, and then into microwave. And so all of this information comes in as 11 files, which the VAC takes. And then they put it through a special algorithm or a, a mathematical process to extract the data. And it comes out as information as a picture. And that's the sort of result they're likely to come up with. And this can be circulated to the airlines. The satellites, um, and that's a list of only four, GEOS, uh, EU METSAT, MTSAT, and INSAT, there's 11 of them, 11 different types float around the atmosphere or outside the atmosphere up there, well and truly outside. These satellites, as I said, there's 11 different varieties and even Geosat has probably about half a dozen up in the, um, in the air. And uh, these are interesting satellites because they are situated at 22,000 miles from the Earth and they rotate at the same angular speed as the, the globe. So if you watch my hands, if my thumb is pointing out from Perth, 22,000 kilometres out here is one of these satellites. And as the Earth rotates six hours, Perth is, Perth is now pointing out that way, and the satellite's out there, still looking vertically down on Perth. And so it goes round. And <coughs> that's a diagram that represents the, the satellite, and that's the picture that it takes. It doesn't sit over Perth, it sits over a place west of uh, New Guinea. But that can capture a series of 11 images every few minutes. And when you see on TV at night uh, the movement of cloud, uh, that's what's happening. This image is stationary, and every time they press the button, they get another set of data, they analyse it and work out what's going on. So it can separate <coughs> the cloud from the ash. All that information in the 11 bands, rather than the red, green and blue, which the eyes see and outside the radar that the aircraft has, um, this ash cloud can be analysed and displayed and circulated to airlines. Other satellites can be in an angular orbit, and they're often at about 700 kilometres, as indicated down here. One of the problems there is that it takes time to capture the information and while the in information is being scanned, the Earth is rotating underneath it, so it's got errors in it. But they can be modelled out. So between the two and um, satellites in equatorial orbit and these that go uh, on an angle, uh, you can get a fairly good idea of what's going on. So <clears throat> the decision is to fly or not fly. And so when you hear, as I did, uh, someone on the radio saying, how dare Qantas not take me to Sydney? You know, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot more involved in it than that. And so the airlines make their decision based on the information from VAC. And so that's the end result. People sitting, waiting in uh, lounges and the aircraft sitting on tarmacs. Thank you. Mm -hmm.